Section 21 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 3, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anne Boulay. Anne of Warwick. Anne of Warwick, the last of our Plantagenet queens, and the first who had previously borne the title of Princess of Wales, was born at Warwick Castle in the year 1454. On each side of the faded, melancholy portrait of this unfortunate lady, in the pictorial history of her maternal ancestry, called the Rue Roll, two mysterious hands are introduced, offering to her the rival crowns of York and Lancaster, while the white bear, the cognizance assumed by her mighty sire, Warwick the Kingmaker, lies muzzled at her feet, as if the royal lions of Plantagenet had quelled the pride of that hitherto blameless bear on the blood-stained heath of Barnet. The principal events which marked the career of her father have been traced in the memoirs of the two preceding queens. Richard Neville, surnamed the king-making Earl of Warwick, was heir, in right of the countess his mother, to the vast inheritance of the Montagues, Earls of Salisbury. He aggrandized himself in a higher degree by his union, in 1448, with Anne, the sister of Beauchamp, Earl of Warwick, who had become sole heiress of that mighty line, by the early death of her niece the preceding year. Richard was soon after summoned to the House of Lords, in right of his wife, as Earl of Warwick. He possessed an income of 22,000 marks per annum, but had no male heir, his family consisting but of two daughters. The eldest, Lady Isabel, was very handsome. Buck calls Lady Anne the better woman of the two, but he gives no reason for the epithet. When, on the convalescence of King Henry, Margaret of Anjou recovered her former influence in the government, Warwick, having good reason to dread her vengeance, withdrew, with his countess and young daughters, to his government of Calais, where much of the childhood and early youth of the Lady Anne were spent. Occasionally, indeed, when the star of York was in the ascendant, Warwick brought the ladies of his family either to his feudal castle or his residence in Warwick Lane. The site of this mansion is still known by the name of Warwick Court. Here the Earl exercised semi-barbarous hospitality. In the year 1458, when a pacification was attempted between the warring houses of York and Lancaster, 600 of the retainers of Anne's father were quartered in Warwick Lane, all dressed alike in red jackets, with the bear and ragged staff, embroidered both before and behind. At Warwick House, six oxen were daily devoured for breakfast, and all the taverns about St. Paul's and Newgate Street were full of Warwick's meat, for anyone who could claim acquaintance with the Earl's red-jacketed gentry might resort to his flesh-pots and, sticking his dagger therein, carry off as much beef as could be taken on a long dagger. At this period, the closest connection subsisted between the families of the Duke of York and the Earl of Warwick. Richard Plantagenet, afterwards Richard III, was two years older than the Lady Anne. He was born October 2nd, 1452, at his father's princely castle of Fotheringay. He was the youngest son of Richard, Duke of York, and his Duchess Sicily, the Earl of Warwick's aunt. At his nativity, says Rue, a contemporary chronicler, the scorpion was in the ascendant. He came into the world with teeth, and with a head of hair reaching to his shoulders. He was small of stature, with a short face and unequal shoulders, the right being higher than the left. Passing over events already related, that led to the deposition of Henry the Sixth. Positive proof may be found that Anne of Warwick and Richard of Gloucester were companions, when he was about fourteen and she was twelve years old. After Richard had been created Duke of Gloucester at his brother's coronation, it is highly probable he was consigned to the guardianship of the Earl of Warwick at Middleham Castle. For, at the grand enthronization of George Neville, the uncle of Anne, as Archbishop of York, Richard was a guest at York Palace, seated in the place of honor, in the chief banqueting room, upon the dais, under a cloth of estate or canopy, with the Duchess of Westmoreland on his left hand, his sister, the Duchess of Suffolk, on his right, and the noble maidens, his cousins, the Lady Anne and the Lady Isabel, seated opposite to him. 
These ladies must have been placed there expressly to please the prince, by affording him companions of his own age, since the Countess of Warwick, their mother, sat at the second table, in a place much lower in dignity. Richard, being the son of Lady Anne's great-aunt, an intimacy naturally subsisted between such near relatives. Majore, a Flemish analyst, affirms that Richard had formed a very strong affection for his cousin Anne, but succeeding events proved that the lady did not bestow the same regard on him which her sister Isabel did on his brother Clarence, nor was it to be expected, considering his disagreeable person and temper. As Lady Anne did not smile on her crookback cousin, there was no inducement for him to forsake the cause of his brother, King Edward. It was in vain his brother Clarence said, in a conference with Warwick, By sweet St. George, I swear, that if my brother Gloucester would join me, I would make Edward know we were all one man's sons, which should be nearer to him than strangers of his wife's blood. Anne was, at this juncture, with her mother and sister at Calais. For, continues Hall, the Earl of Warwick and the Duke of Clarence sailed directly thither, where they were solemnly received and joyously entertained by the Countess of Warwick and her two daughters, and after the Duke had sworn on the sacrament ever to keep part and promise with the Earl, he married Isabel in the Lady Church of Calais, in the presence of the Countess and her daughter Anne. The Earl of Warwick, accompanied by his Duchess and Lady Anne, returned with the newly wedded pair to England, where he and his son-in-law soon raised a civil war that shook the throne of Edward IV. After the loss of the Battle of Edgecote, the Earl of Warwick escaped with his family to Dartmouth, where they were taken on board a fleet of which he was master. On the voyage, they encountered the young Earl of Rivers with the Yorkist fleet, who gave their ships battle and took all excepting the vessel containing the Neville family. While this ship was flying from the victorious enemy, a dreadful tempest arose, and the ladies on board were afflicted at once with terror of wreck and the oppression of seasickness. To add to their troubles, the Duchess of Clarence was taken in labor with her first child. In the midst of this accumulation of disasters, the tempest-tossed bark made the offing of Calais. But in spite of the distress on board, Valcler, whom Warwick had left as his lieutenant, held out the town against him, and would not permit the ladies to land. He, however, sent two flagons of wine on board, for the Duchess of Clarence, with a private message, assuring Warwick, that the refusal arose from the townspeople, and advising him to make some other port in France. The Duchess of Clarence soon after gave birth, on board ship, to the babe who had chosen so inappropriate a time for his entrance into a troublesome world, and the whole family landed safely at Dieppe, the beginning of May, 1470. When they were able to travel, the Lady Anne, her mother and sister, attended by Clarence and Warwick, journeyed across France to Amboise, where they were graciously received by Louis XI, and that treaty was finally completed, which made Anne the wife of Edward, the gallant heir of Lancaster. This portion of the life of Anne of Warwick is so inextricably interwoven with that of her mother-in-law, Queen Margaret, that it were in vain to repeat it a second time. Suffice it to observe that the bride was in her seventeenth, and the bridegroom in his nineteenth year, and that Prevost affirms that the match was one of ardent love on both sides. The prince was well educated, refined in manners, and moreover, his portrait in the Rue Roll bears out the tradition that he was eminently handsome. The ill-fated pair remained in each other's company from their marriage at Angers in August 1470 till the fatal field of Tewkesbury, May 4th, 1471. Although the testimony of George Buck must be received with the utmost caution, yet he quotes a contemporary Flemish chronicler who affirms that, Anne was with her husband, Edward of Lancaster, when that unfortunate prince was hurried before Edward the Fourth after the Battle of Tewkesbury, and that it was observed Richard, Duke of Gloucester, was the only person present who did not draw his sword on the royal captive out of respect to the presence of Anne, as she was the near relative of his mother, and a person whose affections he had always desired to possess. 
English chroniclers, however, affirm that, at this very moment, Anne was with her unhappy mother-in-law, Queen Margaret. After Margaret was taken away to the Tower of London, Clarence privately abducted his sister-in-law, under the pretense of protecting her. As he was her sister's husband, he was exceedingly unwilling to divide the united inheritance of Warwick and Salisbury, which he knew must be done, if his brother Gloucester carried into execution his avowed intention of marrying Anne. But very different was the conduct of the young widow of the Prince of Wales from that described by Shakespeare. Instead of acting as chief mourner to the hearse of her husband's murdered father, she was sedulously concealing herself from her abhorred cousin, enduring every privation to avoid his notice, and concurring with all the schemes of her self-interested brother-in-law Clarence, so completely, as to descend from the rank of Princess of Wales, to the disguise of a servant, in a mean house in London, in the hopes of eluding the search of Gloucester. Incidents too romantic to be believed, without the testimony of a Latin chronicler of the highest authority, who affirms it in the following words. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, wished to discover Anne, the youngest daughter of the Earl of Warwick, in order to marry her. This was much disapproved by his brother, the Duke of Clarence, who did not wish to divide his wife's inheritance. He, therefore, hid the young lady. But the cunning of the Duke of Gloucester discovered her, in the disguise of a cookmaid in the city of London, and he immediately transferred her to the sanctuary of St. Martin's Le Grand. She needed this asylum because she was under the attainer in which her hapless mother and Queen Margaret were included. The unfortunate widow of Prince Edward was, after this, removed to the protection of her uncle George, the Archbishop of York, and was even permitted to visit and comfort her mother-in-law, Queen Margaret, at the tower. But as she still resisted marrying Richard, she was deprived of her uncle's protection, her last refuge against her hated cousin. The unfortunate mother of Anne remained in the sanctuary she had first taken till the same year. A letter of Pastins, dated 1473, observes, that the Countess of Warwick is out of Beaulieu sanctuary, and that Sir James Tyrrell conveyeth her northwards, but the Duke of Clarence liketh it not. And on April 2nd, 1473, he notifies that the world seemeth queasy, for all the persons about the king's person have sent for their armor, on account of the quarrel regarding the inheritance of Anne. The dispute was debated in council, and the king made an award, assigning certain lands to the Duke of Gloucester, and adjudging the rest of the estate to Clarence. This award was made at the expense of Anne, Countess of Warwick, the mother of the young ladies, and the true heiress of the vast estates of Dispenser and Beauchamp. The Act of Parliament specified that the Countess of Warwick was no more to be considered in the award of her inheritance than if she were dead. In fact, Rue accuses Richard of incarcerating, during his life, the venerable Countess Anna, the rightful mistress of the Warwick patrimony, when in her distress she fled to him as her son-in-law for protection, an ill deed which has not commonly been enumerated in the ample list of Richard's iniquities. The marriage of Lady Anne and Richard Duke of Gloucester took place at Westminster, 1473, probably a few days before the date of Paston's letter. Prevost affirms she was compelled by violence to marry Richard. Some illegalities were connected with this ceremony, assuredly arising from the reluctance of the bride, since the parliamentary rolls of the next year contain a curious act, empowering the Duke of Gloucester to continue the full possession and enjoyments of Anne's property, even if she were to divorce him, provided he did his best to be reconciled and remarried to her. Ominous clauses relating to a wedlock of a few months but which proved that Anne mediated availing herself of some informality of her abhorred marriage. But if she had done so, her husband would have remained in possession of her property. The informalities most likely arose from the want of the proper bulls to dispense with relationship, and as the free consent of both bride and bridegroom was an indispensable preliminary to such dispensation, the absence of these legal instruments negatively proved that the unfortunate Anne Neville never consented to her second marriage. 
The birth of her son Edward at Middleham Castle, 1474, probably reconciled the unhappy Duchess of Gloucester to her miserable fate, but that her marriage was never legalized may be guessed by the rumors of a subsequent period, when the venomous hunchback, her cousin husband, mediated in his turn divorcing her. Richard and Anne lived chiefly at Middleham Castle in Yorkshire, an abode convenient for the office borne by the Duke as governor of the Northern Marches. As a very active war was proceeding with Scotland, in the course of which Richard won several battles, and captured Edinburgh, his reluctant wife was not troubled much with his company, but devoted herself to her boy, in whom all her affections were centered, and the very springs of her life wound up in his welfare. During her abode at Middleham, she lost her sister, the Duchess of Clarence, who died December 12, 1476. The death of Edward IV caused a great change in the life of Anne. The Duke of Gloucester, who had very recently returned from Scotland, left Anne and his boy at Middleham, when he departed with a troop of horse, to intercept his young nephew, Edward V, on progress to London. Richard's household book at Middleham affords some noticia regarding the son of Anne of Warwick during his father's absence. Geoffrey Frank is allowed twenty-two shillings nine pence for green cloth, and one shilling eight pence for making it into gowns for my lord prince and Mr. Neville, five shillings for choosing a king of West Witten in some frolic of rush bearing, and five shillings for a feather for my lord prince, and Durick, shoemaker, had thirteen shillings one pence for his shoes, and Jane Collins, his nurse, one hundred shillings for her year's wages. Among the expenses which seem to have occurred on the progress of the young prince up to London, on the occasion of the coronation of his parents, are his offerings at Fountains Abbey and other religious houses, for mending his whip, two pence, and six shillings, eight pence, to two of his men, Medcalf and Paycock, for running on foot by the side of his carriage. After a succession of astounding crimes, Richard effected the usurpation of his nephew's throne, and Anne of Warwick was placed in the situation of consort to an English monarch. She arrived in London with her son, in time to share her husband's coronation, yet we should think her arrival was just before that event, as her rich dress, for the occasion, was only bought two days preceding the ceremony. There is an order to Piers Curtis to deliver for the use of the queen four and a half yards of purple cloth of gold upon Damask, July 3rd. Short time had the tire woman of Anna Warwick to display their skill in the fitting of her regal robes, since this garment was to be worn on the 5th of the same month. Sunday, July 4th, Richard, who had previously been proclaimed king, conducted his queen and her son in great state, by water, from Baynard's castle to the tower, where his hapless little prisoners were made to vacate the royal apartments, and were consigned to a tower near the water gate, since called the Bloody Tower. The same day Anne's only child, Edward, was created Prince of Wales. The grand procession of the king and queen, and their young heir, through the city, took place on the morrow, when they were attended from the tower by four thousand northern partisans, whom the king and queen called gentlemen of the north, but who were regarded by the citizens as an ungentle and suspicious-looking pack of vagabonds. The next day, July 5th, the coronation of Richard and his queen took place, with an unusual display of pageantry, great part of which had been prepared for the coronation of the hapless Edward V. The following day, says Grafton, the king, with Queen Anne, his wife, came down out of the White Hall, into the Great Hall of Westminster, and went directly to the king's bench, where they sat some time, and from thence the king and queen walked barefoot upon striped cloth, unto King Edward's shrine, all their nobility going before them, every lord in his degree. The Duke of Norfolk bore the king's crown before him, between both his hands, and the Duke of Buckingham, with a white staff in his hand, bore the royal hunchback's train. Queen Anne had both earls and barons preceding her. The Earl of Huntingdon bore her scepter, Viscount Lyle, the rod with the dove, and the Earl of Wiltshire, her crown. 
then came continues a contemporary manuscript our sovereign lady the queen over her head a canopy and at every corner a bell of gold and on her head a circlet of gold with many precious stones set therein and on every side of the queen went a bishop and my lady of richmond bare the queen's train so they went from st edward's shrine to the seats of state by the altar and when the king and queen were seated there came forth their highnesses priests and clerks singing most delectably latin and prick song full royally this part of the ceremonial concluded the king and queen came down from their seats of estate and the king had great observance and service our authority states that the king and queen put off their robes and stood all naked from their waists upwards till the bishop had anointed them their majesties afterwards assumed their robes of cloth of gold and cardinal morton crowned them both with much solemnity the priests and clerks sung te duum with great royalty the homage was paid at that part of the mass called the offertory during which time the queen sat with the bishops and peeresses while richard received the kiss of fealty from his peers the bishop of exeter and norwich stood on each side of the queen the countess of richmond was on her left hand and the duchess of norfolk knelt behind the queen with the other ladies then the king and queen came down to the high altar and kneeled and anon the cardinal turned him about with the holy sacrament in his hand and parted it between them both and thus they received the good lord their crowns were offered as usual at st edward's shrine the king proceeded out of the abbey church and the queen followed bearing the sceptre in her right hand and the dove with the rod in her left so going forth till they came to the high dais at westminster hall and when they came there they left their canopies standing and retired to their chamber meantime the duke of norfolk came riding into westminster hall his horse trapped with cloth of gold down to the ground and he voided it of all people but the king's servants and the duke of buckingham called to the marshal saying how the king would have his lord sit at four boards in the hall and at four o'clock the king and queen came to the high dais on the queen's right hand stood my lady surrey and on her left the lady nottingham holding a canopy of state over her head the king sat at the middle of the table the queen at the left hand of the table and on each side of her stood a countess holding a cloth of pleasance when she listed to drink the champion of england after dinner rode into the hall and made his challenge without being gainsaid the lord mayor served the king and queen with ipocras wafers and sweet wine and by that time it was dark night anon came into the hall great lights of wax torches and torchettes and as soon as the lights came up the hall the lords and ladies went up to the king and made their obeisance and anon the king and queen rose up and went to their chambers and every man and woman departed and went their ways where it liked them best after the coronation queen anne went to windsor castle with the king and her son here richard left her while he undertook a devious progress ending at tewkesbury the queen and prince then commenced a splendid progress in which they were attended by many prelates and peers and the spanish ambassador who had come to propose an alliance between the eldest daughter of his sovereigns ferdinand and isabella and the son of richard the third the queen took up her abode at warwick castle the place of her birth and the grand feudal seat of her father which belonged to the young earl of warwick the son of her sister isabel and the duke of clarence and it is especially noted that the queen brought him with her richard the third joined his queen at warwick castle where they kept court with great magnificence for a week it must have been at this visit that the portraits of queen anne of richard the third and their son were added to the rue roll the popular opinion concerning richard's deformity is verified by the portrait for his figure if not crooked is decidedly hunchy nor must this appearance be attributed to the artist's lack of skill in delineating the human form for the neighboring portraits by the same hand representing anne's father the great earl of warwick is as finely proportioned as if meant for a model of st george richard on the contrary has high thick shoulders and no neck 
Surely, if the king's ungainly figure had not been matter of great notoriety, an artist capable of making such a noble sketch as that of the earl would not have brought the king's ears and shoulders in quite such close contact. Warwick was dead, Richard was alive, when these series of portraits closes. Therefore, if any pictorial flattery exists, in all probability Richard had the advantage of it. Among other contemporary descriptions of Richard, not generally known, is the following metrical portrait, though author seems inclined to apologize for drawing him as he really was. The king's own brother, he, I mean, who was deformed by nature, crook-backed and ill-conditioned, worse-faced and ugly creature, yet a great peer for princes, peers, are not always beauteous. From Warwick Castle, Queen Anne and King Richard went to Coventry, where was dated August 15th, 1483, a memorandum of an account of 180 pounds owed to Richard Gowles, Mercer, London, for goods delivered for the use of Queen Anne, as specified in bills in the care of John Kendall, the King's secretary. The court arrived at York, August 31st. The re-coronation of the king and queen, likewise the reinvestiture of Prince Edward of Gloucester as Prince of Wales, took place soon after at this city. Measures which must have originated in the fact that the sons of Edward the Fourth had been put to death during the northern progress of the court, the usurper considered that oaths of allegiance taken at the re-coronation would be more legal than when the right heirs were alive. The overflowing paternity of Richard, which, perhaps, urged him to commit some of his crimes, thus speaks in his patents for creating his son Prince of Wales, whose singular wit and endowments of nature wherewith, his young age considered, he is remarkably furnished, do portend, by the favor of God, that he will make an honest man. But small chance was there for such a miracle if his life had been spared, it is curious that Richard the Third should express hopes for his son's future honesty at the very moment when he was putting him in possession of his murdered cousin's property. After the coronation had been performed in York Cathedral, Queen Anne walked in grand procession through the streets of the city, holding her little son by the right hand. He wore the demi-crown appointed for the heir of England. The Middleham Household Book mentions that five marks were paid to Mitchell Wharton, for bringing the prince's jewels from York on this occasion. The same document proves that the court were at Pontefract, September 15th, that fearful fortress recently stained with the blood of Richard's victims. Richard gave, by the way, in charity to a poor woman, three shillings six pence. The charge of baiting the royal charret was two pence, and the expenses of the removal of my lord prince's household to Pontefract, twenty-four shillings. A formidable insurrection, headed by the Duke of Buckingham, recalled Richard to the metropolis. He left his son for security among his northern friends, but Queen Anne accompanied her husband. It is a doubtful point whether Anne approved of the crimes which thus advanced her son. Tradition declares she abhorred them, but parliamentary documents prove she shared with James Tyrrell the plunder of Richard's opponents after the rebellion of Buckingham was crushed. She received 100 marks, the king 700 marks, and Sir James Tyrrell two manors from Sir William Nivet, being the purchase money for his life. Anne's share of this plunder amounts to considerably more than her portion of queen's gold. If Anne had even passively consented to the unrighteous advancement of her family, punishment quickly followed, for her son, on the last day of March, 1484, died at Middleham Castle, an unhappy death. This expression, used by Rue, his family chronicler, leads his readers to imagine that this boy, so deeply idolized by his guilty father, came by his end in some sudden and awful manner. His parents were not with him, but were as near as Nottingham Castle when he expired. The loss of this child, in whom all Anne's hopes and happiness were garnered, struck to her heart, and she never again knew a moment's health or comfort. She seemed even to court death eagerly. Nor was this dreadful loss her only calamity. Richard had no other child. His declining and miserable consort was not likely to bring another, and if he did not consider her in the way, 
his guilty and ruffian satellites certainly did, for they began to whisper dark things concerning the illegality of the king's marriage, and the possibility of it being set aside. As Edward the Fourth's Parliament considered that it was possible for Anne to divorce Richard in 1474, it cannot be doubted that Richard could have resorted to the same manner of getting rid of her when queen. Her evident decline, however, prevented Richard from giving himself any trouble regarding a divorce, yet it did not restrain him from uttering peevish complaints to Rotherham, Archbishop of York, regarding his wife's sickliness and disagreeable qualities. Rotheringham, who had just been released from as much coercion as a king of England dared offer a spiritual peer, who had not appeared in open insurrection, ventured to prophesy, from these expressions, that Richard's queen would suddenly depart from this world. This speech got circulated in the guard chamber, and gave rise to a report that the queen, whose personal sufferings and a protracted decline had caused her to keep her chamber for some days, was actually dead. Anne was sitting at her toilet, with her tresses unbound, when this strange rumor was communicated to her. She considered it was the forerunner of her death by violent means, and, in a great agony, ran to her husband, with her hair disheveled as it was, and streaming eyes and piteous sobs asked him, what she had done to deserve death. Richard, it is expressly said, soothed her with fair words and smiles, bidding her, be of good cheer, for, in sooth, she had no other cause. The next report which harassed the declining and dying queen was, that her husband was impatient for her demise, that he might give his hand to his niece, the Princess Elizabeth of York. This rumor had no influence on the conduct of Anne, since the continuator of the Croylan Chronicle mentions the queen's kindness to her husband's niece, in these words. The Lady Elizabeth, who had been some months out of sanctuary, was sent by her mother to attend the queen at court, at the Christmas festivals kept with great state in Westminster Hall. Elizabeth and her four sisters were received with all honorable courtesy by Queen Anne, especially the Lady Elizabeth was ranked most familiarly in the Queen's favor, who treated her as a sister. But neither society that she loved, nor all the pomp and festivity of royalty, could cure the languor or heal the wound in the Queen's breast for the loss of her son. The young Earl of Warwick was, after the death of Richard's son, proclaimed heir to the English throne, and as such took his seat at the royal table during the lifetime of his aunt, Queen Anne. As these honors were withdrawn from the ill-fated boy directly after the death of the queen, it is reasonable to infer that he owed them to some influence she possessed with her husband, since young Warwick, as her sister's son, was her heir as well as his. Within the year that deprived Anne of her only son, maternal sorrow put an end to her existence, by a decline slow enough to acquit her husband of poisoning her, a crime of which he is accused by most writers. She died at Westminster Palace on March 16, 1485, in the midst of the greatest eclipse of the sun that had happened for many years. Her funeral was most pompous and magnificent. Her husband was present and was observed to shed tears, deemed hypocritical by the bystander, but those who knew that he had been brought up with Anne might suppose that he felt some instinctive yearnings of long companionship when he saw her laid in that grave where his ambitious interests had caused him to wish her to be. Human nature, with all its conflicting passions and instincts, abounds with such inconsistencies, which are often startlingly apparent in the hardest characters. The queen was interred near the altar at Westminster, not far from the monument of Anne of Cleves. No memorial marks the spot where the broken heart of the hapless Anne of Warwick found rest, from as much sorrow as could possibly be crowded into the brief span of thirty-one years. End of section 21. End of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 3, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland.